Everybody, you're listening to Chatting with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Horback. Before we start this week's episode, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandace.com and sign up for our Patreon account. You get early access to episodes, bonus content, live AMAs, and your support really helps us to continue podcasting. This week's guest is Matt Thomas. He is the world champion at chess boxing, founder and director of Brawl for a Cause, founder of Fight and Flow, and more recently known for being on the cast of Love is Blind. I'm so excited that he got to join us, and I hope you really enjoy the conversation. For everybody listening, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of... um... You've had like a very busy couple of years. <laughs> a little, little all over the place, I guess. But yeah, sure. My name is Matt Thomas. Uh, I'm 30 years old. I'm founder of a nonprofit called Brawl for a Cause. And I'm developing a fitness concept called Fight and Flow. Um, I'm involved with a sport called chess boxing. It's a combination of the board game chess with the combat sport boxing. Uh, So I really like things that combine two antithetical or opposite things like chess and boxing. Fight and flow is a combination between martial arts and yoga. Uh, Brawl for a cause is combining philanthropy with fitness or fighting. So um, I I really like this this idea of bringing two opposites like a yin and yang and and, and marrying them, uh, bringing them together. So. Yeah, and um, and I, this is the first where we're actually you know speaking outside of text. So uh, mm-hmm. really appreciate you having me on. I'm glad Brandon put us together, and I'm um, looking forward to this. Yeah, when he was telling me about you, I was like, that just sounds like such an interesting person. He was like explaining chess boxing, which I had no idea even existed. <laughs> I still like need to watch some videos of that because that's just like wild to me. Um, and then your nonprofit and then how you're trying to like create a new workout, which is like really fascinating. And then you were on a ra- reality TV show and then he was explaining like kind of like a, he touched on like your spiritual beliefs and you just sounded like such a like unique individual. So I was like, yeah, I would love to like get to know this person. Um, so I guess if you want to like – I guess we can start with like chess boxing. How did you get into chess boxing? Like how did you even discover that was a thing? Yeah, so it it found me. I got really, really lucky. Um, so I, I went to the University of Georgia, and that's where I started boxing. My mom never let me do any kind of competitive martial arts growing up. Um, so when I got to Georgia, I started taking boxing lessons. I started competing for the UGA club boxing team. And then I, I started uh, competing in the amateur circuit. So my very first amateur fight, I dislocated my shoulder in the first round. Um, I continued the fight. I ended up winning after I I put my shoulder back in, but the the shoulder injury required uh, a really intense surgery that put me out for about six months. So in those six months, I was sitting in bed. I was getting chubby, watching YouTube. And um, I I grew up playing chess competitively. And and so I've returned to chess periodically through my life, especially when I have downtime. Uh, Mm -hmm. because I really love the game. So uh, recovering from surgery was one of those (laughs) times where I was playing a lot of chess, watching a lot of YouTube, and no joke, you know the the, like sidebar on YouTube where it serves you videos? Uh Uh-huh. Next up was a chess boxing video. (laughs) So so YouTube's algorithm, it it works really well (laughs) because (laughs) it knew me super well, and uh, and I didn't even have to click on the video. It auto-played. So... (laughs) Um, I, I watched that. I was like, this can't, this has to be like a spoof. Like this has to be a joke. Like someone is actually combining chess with boxing. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like those are my two favorite things. I feel like I was born for this sport. <laughs> you know, like, uh, so I, I went down that rabbit hole. I watched every video online. I started reading articles about it. I tracked down the founder of the sport. He created the sport in 2003 um, a, a Dutchman who, uh, who actually passed two months ago, Ipe. Um, and, and I reached out to him while I was recovering from surgery. And I was like, hey, listen, man, like, I love what you created. I'd love to get involved. 
Um, and he was like, great. Like, we've never had an American compete before. Let's get you signed up. Let's get you in uh, over to Europe. And, and, um, and, and I was like, hey, listen, you know, I, I'm, I'm at least six months from being able to hit a heavy bag. I'm probably a year out or more from being able to get in fight shape again. Uh, he said, just reach back out when, when, when you're back in shape. So, um, so yeah, so that, that, that's how I found the sport. And then it, it, it just kind of ran away with me. Um, <laughs> I, I can't seem to get away from it. Not that I want to, but it's, uh, it's a weird little world. Weird, it attracts a lot of interesting people. <laughs> I was going to ask, so like, what do you, like, what do you think the difference are, differences are between like the, like athletes that just normal box versus the ones that are combining it with chess? Cause there has to be a difference, right? Yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time around boxers. Like I'm, I'm in boxing gyms a lot. Fighters have a, have a mentality that um, is really attractive to me because they, they, they encounter pain and adversity on a regular basis. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and pain and adversity is inevitable in life, but a lot of people try to um, stay away from, from pain and adversity like it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But all the, all the best things that have happened in my life have, have come right after or because of some sort of pain or, or adversity that I navigated. And sometimes that's, that's a hard lesson learned. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, a, it's, it's like my best triumph. You know, so it's, um, I, I think in general, fighters have the kind of, mentality and spirit that that sees adversity as opportunity and and struggle as potential for strength mm -hmm. um and so I, I really like that about you know fighters in general and then I, I think the added wrinkle with chess boxers is chess is a game that requires you to to visualize a lot you're, you're looking moves ahead to decide what the best option uh, to take is so you have what's called candidate moves Generally, you'll have between two and five candidate moves of all moves that could do something. Mm -hmm. um, and you're trying to decide what, what something is the best for whatever your, your game plan is. So it, it, it introduces a level of strategy and thinking ahead that um, maybe some fighters don't have. So, you know, fighting in general is a very short term focused kind of career, right? You kind of got to get in and out. You, you don't have much time to, to fight. Yeah, like most fighters retire early, mid thirties. Mm -hmm. right? So you're 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 in and out. Um, chess boxing is something you can do for a much longer time mm -hmm. because boxing is 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 so much less of a component. It, you, you have more chess rounds than boxing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot more rest in between rounds. So I, I think the strategic thinking ahead component is something that is uh, unique to to chess boxing and um, and something that I like more because uh, I. I I can't be a professional fighter, especially at this stage. <laughs> um, and and I, I wouldn't necessarily want that life for me, future family, that kind of thing. So um, I, I'm glad I found this as a, as a fun hobby and, and, and something to help build in, in the West and in the United States. So do you think that that's kind of like an innate like um, personality trait in like people that gravitate towards boxing, the whole concept of like leaning into discomfort to like have the opportunity for growth, or do you think that's something learned, or do you think it's both? It's a good question. I, I think I think it's probably a combination of both. I think some people um, have it and understand it from an early age. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think early adversity is, mm -hmm. is a good indicator of of future success. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think one component is, is people who have early adversity tend to, tend to gravitate towards things that use adversity as opportunity and struggle as strength. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, you know, that my nonprofit basically takes people that have no business being in a ring and puts them in a ring against each other to raise money for charity. So how do you train like that? I think is so crazy. I was watching some of the videos I could find online and the whole concept of like being a civilian and then tossed into a ring to fight somebody that it's terrifying to me. Like I'm very like, um, I guess like risk averse when it comes to like getting physically hurt, like just not something I'm interested in. So how do you take someone that's like, let's say an accountant and like get him ready to like do like this really physically trying task for charity. So, yeah, I'll, I'll focus first on the last part that you said, physically challenging. And it is definitely that. You know, like there's no shape like fight shape, mm -hmm. right? 
thing to fight another human being, th there's nothing that will instill discipline in you like that. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you have trouble giving up cheese dip or beer or whatever, <laughs> like have a date where you're going to fight another human being and it's going to be easy to give that stuff up because you're always going to have in your head like that person's not eating cheese dip. Mm -hmm. That person's waking up at six and getting the road work in, running the stadiums, doing the, the, the you know, three mile run, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so like the, the physical component is interesting. What, what my favorite part of, of the whole Brawl for a Cause journey is, is the, the mental component. Because really what, what we're doing, and we don't say this explicitly like, you know, out loud, but what we're doing is we're training people how to set a goal, how to work towards it, even when it's hard, mm -hmm. and how to take that model and, and apply it to other goals after Brawl for a Cause. Because if you can do this, you can, you can apply the same thing. You know, there's definitely things harder than Brawl for a Cause, but mm -hmm. you can do the same thing for any goal. You plug and play the goal and, and the same type of, of build up, overcoming adversity, overcoming trials, building up momentum and confidence, all of that can be applied to other goals in life. Mm -hmm. So the, the mindset training is, is what I think is the most beneficial part of all of it. You know, yeah, you'll get into great shape. Yeah, you'll look great in front of your friends and family and people that support your cause and the community. Because win or lose, you're a freaking hero when you mm -hmm. do this. Scary thing. People know that. They know that you're not a fighter, not trying to be a fighter. <laughs> yourself in harm's way to, to do this for the very first time just to raise funds and awareness for something you believe in so you know like you win no matter what you're mm -hmm. against someone else who's just as scared and has no idea what they're doing either <laughs> and you get to walk away with all these lessons learned all this funds and awareness raised for this change that you want to see in the world and this community of people that have all gone through a shared experience we're now, you know, you're coming to, to brawl veteran events and, uh, and getting a workout in or, or trying a new restaurant in town. And, and you, you've all gone through the same thing. Even if you've never met before, you have some common ground. So it's, it's a good way to, to make friends and, and join a community. Do you see like an overarching theme in people that you are like training for their fight? Like um, common hurdles that you have to help them get over? Like everyone has like these taught like these three things that are kind of holding them back or psyching them out or is it kind of all over the place you're a great question asker by the thank way. you i'm so new to this so i get a little bit nervous i'm like i don't have a crutch i'm like i try to just wing it so thank you well we're just having a conversation yeah yeah way to do it so um have you heard of joseph campbell or the hero's journey no okay so joseph campbell wrote this book called hero with a thousand faces and this thing is like turning into my Bible. And mm -hmm. uh, Hero of the Thousand Faces took heroes from all different cultures, all different time periods, and put them all right up next to each other. So you're studying Hercules at the same time you're studying George Washington at the same time you're studying all these different people from all these different mythologies and, and fairy tales and whatever. So what he broke down is, is uh, basic steps through a hero's journey that every single hero navigates. So there's always a, a death and rebirth when you become a hero. There's, there's this death of this old version of you and mm -hmm. this rebirth of this you know, striving hero that's embarking on this journey. There's a departure from the comfort zone or from home. So you, you, get, you have to leave uh, some sort of like where you grew up or it, take like Simba in The Lion King, for example. Like when Mufasa dies, mm -hmm. he has to leave Pride Rock because now Scar's on his back trying to you know, make sure that that the air doesn't come. So he has to go out into the wilderness, out into the jungle. And then that's really when the, the journey begins. You have, you have training that starts and training usually is introduced by mentors. Simba's mentors were Timon and Pumbaa, teach them how to eat bugs and navigate the jungle. Um, you know, in Star Wars, it was Yoda teaching Luke how to, you know, levitate things and use the force. Um, and for us, we, we assign a brawl mentor, someone that has already gone through our program, already had their moment in the arena and fought to help new brawlers through the experience, from experience. Mm -hmm. And then I think this is the part that you're asking about, that the next step when training begins, trials begin. So a trial is not your final face the dragon kind of moment, the ultimate. It's a, a bunch of little subsets of what you'll eventually face. And you get to face them in little bite-sized chunks and build up this momentum to overcome this, this big, you know, scary thing in the future. Mm -hmm. 
I'll, I'll share three things that every single brawler has to overcome. One, they have to get punched in the face. One of the first things that we do is we're like, hey, this is going to happen a lot over the next three months. First sparring day, let's go. You're getting in there with me. I know how to pull a punch. I'm not going to knock you out, but you're going to feel what a jab to the nose feels like. Ooh. Might get a bloody nose. Like it's, yeah. it's part of this. It, and, and the sooner that you normalize it, the less it affects you. So mm-hmm. go ahead and just get over the fact that you don't want to get punched. <laughs> There's no way around it. Mm-hmm. Like no matter how good of a boxer you are, Muhammad Ali got punched. Floyd Mayweather got punched. You know, it, it happens. Number two, you're raising funds and awareness for something you believe in. And you got to change your mindset from begging for money to giving people an opportunity for generosity. Mm-hmm. So everyone has to pick up the phone and call 10 people. Tell them on what they're doing and say, I care about this so much, I'm only to get punched in the face for it. And here's an opportunity to be more generous, to give and, and support me, not just in this journey, but support this change that I want to see in the world. Mm-hmm. That's a scary thing to do. That, I, I would rather get punched in the face a hundred times than call 10 people. Well, I'm opposite. Total opposite. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so everyone's a little different. Everyone navigates these a little differently. Okay. Third one is for two months, you go through this journey as one cohesive unit. No one knows who's fighting someone else. And, and, and that's important because we need to see how people would match up to make the best possible, possible matchups, make sure they're fair, safe, and entertaining. Mm-hmm. So 30 days out, you find out who you're actually facing. Mm. And, and when that has, you know, that, that ambiguous, yeah, I'm fighting someone in three months goes from like, you know, a, a, a kind of an undefined cloud to like an actual person in person. You don't really know how to interact with them. It could be a little bit awkward. Hey, we're fighting in three mo- in a month, but you know, for the last 60 days, we've been friends and training together. Like how does that change? Mm-hmm. So it's navigating uncomfortable situations and having uncomfortable conversations. Um, and I, I, there's a quote I love success can be measured in the number of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have. Like putting, putting the people that are mashed up together, together right off the bat mm-hmm. to co-create promo content where mm-hmm. they get together, they train together. They, they talk about how they match up. They're posting at the same time on social media, forcing them to be a team all the way through the process mm-hmm. is really, really beneficial. And the people that are most successful in Brawl for Calls are the people that lean all the way into that. Even though it's weird or awkward or scary, they, they take it on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that would be the weirdest part too. I was like trying to put myself in that situation and I was like, oh, but then if you know the person, then you feel even worse if you hit them and then it's like a, you don't want to like give it your all necessarily because you're like, oh, what if they like take it personal? So I think there has to be like an aspect of, I guess, like being able to put yourself in and out of that situation, like understanding that it's not personal and it is for like a good cause. Just, it's really badass. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And you hit the nail on the head. It's retraining your brain. It's reframing a situation where you would normally feel a certain way, but you can choose to see it a more positive way, a more productive way. And I think that's a really good life lesson to to take away. So do you think that your interest in like fighting and boxing kind of led you onto like your spiritual path? Because I find like a lot of fighters and boxers, like they're either very like religious or very spiritual. They have like a different kind of perspective than I guess like a non-fighter. Like I find like a lot of them kind of maybe lean into like Buddhism or med- like not a- that meditation is like um, a religion obviously, but like it's like a- it is a spiritual practice in a sense. So do you think that those things like couple or did you find that like independently of fighting? Yeah, so I'll give like a spark note history of, of like spiritual or religious background. Mm-hmm. And, then, um, and then talk about kind of what made me believe what I believe now. So born Catholic, baptized Catholic. Um, mom is Irish Catholic, has eight siblings. Like they're all the way in on the no birth control mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, and... After my parents separated, my mom, uh, like, took us out of the Catholic Church because they were making her, like, pay to, um, for me to be legitimate or have an annulment or all this, all this like, red tape stuff that she was just not about. Mm-hmm. I, I ended up growing up Protestant. Um, I went to Methodist Church my whole life. 
And I started having doubts when I was in high school and in college of like, Hey, all this stuff that they're saying and preaching, like there are good morals here. Like the, these, these, uh, you know, Sermon on the Mount, uh, these parables, all these things have, have like good content, mm -hmm. but I don't believe this, like, like literally, like, I don't believe that women were made from a rib of a man. I don't believe that, um, you know, the, the whole world flooded and that everyone was repopulated from a, a dude and his family on a boat with two of every animal. Mm -hmm. but, but I believe in the metaphorical significance of hey, the, the world can become too corrupt and need to be wiped out, kind of like what's happening now yeah. in, in its own way. This, this, can, this can be seen as a, as a flood type of, mm -hmm. of experience. So, you know, I, I started seeing uh, the Bible and, and organized religion less literally and more figuratively. And that opened my mind to be able to see anything as spiritual. So mm -hmm. it didn't have to be this, uh, this holy book straight from the hand of God, whoever God is. Mm -hmm. um, or, or whatever, uh, you know, either Messiah or, or saints that, that was able to talk to God and, and bring the words to the people. But I started to see everything as an expression of God. So it, any kind of creative work, it, these, these fairy tales, the, the works of Joseph Campbell with the, the hero of the thousand faces, all those things have the same types of parables, mm -hmm. the same types of wisdom. And um, and, and it became more of a, a kind of um, a temperature check or, or a, um, a, a way to, to figure out what was right for, for me. Of, of, yeah, this, this moral, you know, I, I've learned this lesson the hard way, the same way that this character in the story did. And so I, I know that there's truth in that. So that's, that's something that I should add to my moral compass as opposed to other things where it's like, no, I haven't experienced that. I haven't seen that. I can let that go. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, if you ask me in college, I would have considered myself an atheist um, in, in terms of like believing that there was a God that religions preach about. Mm -hmm. But I would, have, I would have considered myself very spiritual because I, I, was, I, I opened my mind to look at everything through uh, a, a lens like, hey, is this, is this something that is, is a good way to live life or a bad way to live life based off of action and reaction? Mm -hmm. and, and in college is when I was introduced to Eastern religions. Um, I, I had a near death experience my junior year and, uh, and had an interaction with something, uh, something I didn't understand. Some would, some people could call it divine or, or God. Some people could call it um, just a traumatic brain injury <laughs> and you know, seeing things and talking to people or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, um, but after that, that's when I started like digging deeper into um, not just what Western religion says, but, uh, but what, uh, people from uh, other parts of the world or people from other time periods say. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when I came across, uh, Taoism and, and Buddhism, it really resonated because that same kind of looking at life through the lens of action and reaction is mm -hmm. essentially karma. Karma mm -hmm. doesn't mean that there's good karma and bad karma. It just means that there's a reaction for every action. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a balance. There's something that rounds it out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so karma kind of brought me into, uh, this, this Buddhist journey. And, um, I, I ended up living in Thailand for a few months. I, I spent time in India and Bali. Um, I, I, I did a silent meditation retreat at a, uh, at a monastery in Chom Tong, um, Thailand. Uh, that was completely, uh, eye-opening and, and, and forced me to, to dig really deep into my own traumas and past relationship baggage and, and at least acknowledge a lot of what, what I had to work on when I was so focused on what's wrong with the world and other people, like it, it, it turned it inward and like, oh, like my only job is to work on myself in this life. Like if I can take care of myself and fill up my cup, I can overflow in other people. I can be an example for others. I can um, mm -hmm. have more to, to give and support and and lead. And, and so, um, that really shift my perspective, just spending time, not talking to anyone except for myself in my head, uh, and, and just observing what kind of thoughts and feelings and patterns arise. Um, and so, so once that happened, I was like, okay, this, this, uh, journey through the self to the self 
uh, approach of Taoism and, and Buddhism is is for me. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it. I don't think you can go wrong um, with religion in general. I don't think there are any bad religions. Mm-hmm. I, I think there are bad people in religion that that kind of give them a, a that certain group or sect a bad rap. Like, I don't think all Catholics are bad because some Catholic priests do terrible things to children. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't think all Catholics are good just because they're Catholic either. So like, it's, you know, there's, there's good and bad people in every, every group like that. Um, so it's just what resonates with you and, and that, that kind of approach resonates with me. And it sounds like it, it's similar for you or you, what, what's your background in that? So I was raised Catholic as well. Well, it, it's kind of confusing. So um, my on my dad's side is Japanese. So my grandma is like Buddhist and very spiritual and not Western at all. Um, and then my mom's side of the family was raised Catholic. So we were baptized the whole nine. And like that never really like felt right to me. I was always the kid that was kind of getting like tossed in the hall because I was asking like too many questions. Um, so I was like, well, this isn't, this does just doesn't make sense from a young age. Like a lot of it didn't make sense because they want you to take it so literal, or at least the people that were teaching me did. So I just always like really had like this admiration for my grandmother. And like, I just kind of gravitated towards like the way that she practiced. Um, and then I feel like it kind of went away for me, like, I think with a lot of like teenagers and kids, like you want to fit in and be cool and like, at least where I grew up in like upstate New York, it's definitely not cool to be like spiritual or talk about like if you believe in karma or reincarnation or anything like that. So then I went through maybe like what you would call like an atheist phase as well where I was like, oh, like, you know, nothing matters. We're just here. Like there's no meaning. Um, And I was fine with that for a while. And then it was like a weird like – like kind of series of events. So we went to this thing called BioCybernaut and I like talk about it to death because it was like such a life-changing week for me. So it's essentially alpha brainwave training. So like how to get into flow, be a peak performer. Like I was pitched this like from a very practical sense, like your business will benefit, like you'll just be a better leader. All of these like, you know, very worldly benefits, like nothing woo-woo or mystical. So we get there and Sorry to you. Oh no, you're fine. Bio Cybernaut. I it's like honestly, I tell everybody I meet. I actually got a girlfriend to go there, um, and she did a week in at the Vancouver office, and the same thing for her. She had like this insane experience. Um, but everyone go, like that leaves is going to take something different away from it, and it depends on like who your your teacher is for that week. So to give you like a quick summary of what it looks like, it's um, an undetermined amount of hours. So you go in and you check in your phone. So you don't know how long you're going to be there for the day. Um, They give you a quick overview, some like quick little tasks to do like mental training. Then they stick you in this room that gets blackout dark. You're connected to a bunch of electrodes and it converts through the wall and gives you um, feedback auditorily. So like you can hear what parts of your brain are firing. So you, the whole time you're trying to like meditate to get it like a certain brainwave reaction and you're in this box for like hours. You can't see anything. No one's there. It's freezing. It's just you and your brain waves. So it's kind of similar. Seated? Are you laying down? You're seated. Floating? Okay. Yep. You're seated. You can't be like dozing off because like you can tell when you start dozing off. Like it's like a mindful meditation practice. Um, So are they give you guidance for that meditation? Are they like focus on your breath? Are they like repeat? That is the crazy thing. I have I had a really bad meditation practice going in. I didn't have a lot of experience. They kind of just throw you in on day one, and they're like, just create um, alpha waves. And you're like, what? What do you mean? Like, I don't even know what an alpha wave is. Like, do I hear something? Like, they just kind of want to see where you naturally go for like the first session. So we had two different chunks each day, um, like time blocks. So the first time block, it was just like you're on your own, no guidance whatsoever. Just try to figure it out. And surprisingly, you kind of do, which is really weird. So by the end of day one, they kind of explain a way that's like easier to get there, which is through forgiveness work. 
So for some reason, when you practice the true act of forgiving, like to a cellular level, your brain just kind of goes into this alpha state. So they want you to kind of feel what that feels like. And then you can kind of get there when you need to. Like if you have like a task that you want to like iron out or if you have like – if you want to try to get into flow, if you're an athlete, just to like recognize that feeling just so you can have like a sense of the feedback. So – Spending a week doing forgiveness work, like you've learned so much about yourself. It's kind of like when you were talking about looking inward versus outward. And I think like that's something that everybody can like learn from is, you know, it's the whole like internal or internal locus of control versus like external. So like, for example, I just got in a fight with my mom the other day (laughs) and it could have easily been like, oh, well, she said this and that's why I reacted. And it's like, no, like I was bottling things up and I wasn't processing these things in a healthy way. So then I exploded, right? So it's just like a very different way to experience the world. And I think if you focus inward that you just learn so much about who you are and then you really can't be mad at anyone else. So after a week of doing all of this, I kind of like rediscover who I am and I just feel lighter and happier and healthier. And I've like forgiven all of these people in my life that I was like holding on to like this really like negative weight. And um, our instructor was actually like the founder, Dr. Hart, and he's like very into like the whole mystical stuff. So he started introducing these concepts to me and I just like – I just dove in off the deep end. I was like, this is like the path that I'm supposed to be on. I'm supposed to be like crafting myself spiritually and like learning more about that and like leading like just a happier, lighter life and not looking externally like I was. Like I was just walking through life like it's their fault. It's my mom's fault. It's my dad's fault. And, you know, these people on social media, like they're the reason I'm so angry, like whatever it is. I just kind of like left a completely different person. So then we got home. We have a shaman now. We do like – he comes to the house at least once a month. Like we're just like completely into it. Um, But it was like my husband got me to go to the whole retreat because he's like, oh, you'll make more money. Like he knew it was going to get a little bit woo-woo and like mystical and that there was going to be like a lot of like meditation. I had no clue. Um, But it's the best thing I've ever done, like hands down. Sounds amazing. So how long ago was this? Um, Three years now. Okay. Mm-hmm. And in those three years, can you, can you track things that you were doing before that you no longer do or track things that you weren't doing before that you now do? So I feel like it's anything else. It's like a constant like learning and like reevaluating because anything else like you'll do great as soon as you leave for maybe like the first few months. Like you're on this high. And then I think it's so easy to slip into old patterns, whether it's like the way that you think or how you act or like maybe your social circle. Um But for me, like I would start noticing those slips and then I would like have to like quickly correct course and go back to where I wanted to be. So I think it's like constantly just trying to like stay within like the buoys, if you will. Um, I mean, just like the other day when I said I got in a fight with my mom, it was like not the way I wanted to react. And I was like, oh, like this is not how I want my future self to show up, right? Like I try to like look at things like that way. Like how do you – how is your future self? How do they react to things? Who are their friends? What do they do? What do they think? All of that. Um, so I was like very disappointed in myself, but I mean, those are going to happen because we're humans and we make mistakes. So it's just being able to like recognize like those, um, downward slips and then like re-navigate back to where you want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just like patient. Monkey mind scurries off mm-hmm. to a focal point. Totally. That's really cool. I, I'd love to follow up with you on that. Uh, yeah. Is, is it something, um, I mean, do they have multiple locations? Is it only? They have one in Vancouver, one in Sedona, and then one in Germany. Um, but oh, which one did you go to? I did the one in Sedona. Yeah, it was great. And we like – it was just like one of those things that was just like faded. Like we paid to do the like the daily doubles for a week and we – um, just like picked a random instructor and then the the guy Dr. Hart like he founded it it's like his baby just happened to be there and he's like wildly expensive if you book with him um, just happened to be there and we just like got him at like this huge deal and I was like oh my gosh I just feel like 
I wouldn't have had like such like an immense reaction to the whole experience if it wasn't with him just because he's like such a unique and like intense person. Um, and he was like perfect for me. Like he's like the person I needed to like kind of be my um, my mentor. So if it was anyone else, I don't know how significant it would have been for me, but it was it was just perfect. I like I couldn't you know recommend it enough. Sounds really powerful. Mm-hmm. Totally was. It sounds like a monastery with data. You know, I don't think monks are running around with nodes to plug into your brain. Mm-mm. It sounds like the same type of work. It's just. Oh, totally. And the interesting thing is he, on average, the people that do the weekly doubles by the end of it, they have the same um, like control over their brainwaves and can reach like certain levels of alpha as a um, monk that's been practicing for 20 years after one week of doubles. Wow. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. If that's like your jam, it's definitely something to, to check out for sure. All right. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely dive into this. It's something I I think uh, it, you did this with your husband. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's you will leave you will either leave more in love than you thought was possible, or you're gonna leave divorced. It's like it's <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's very kind of like doing, a, doing an acid trip with your significant other. Basically, yeah. Kind of deal. <laughs> And <laughs> definitely you're like both like understand each other on like a totally different level and you're you're either like okay like we're meant to be or like okay this isn't gonna last much longer so let's just call it for what it is right yeah i'd love to explore that it, um i i have a girlfriend of four months we met at the beginning of quarantine uh remotely and after 10 days decided to move into a, w- with each other so she flew from san francisco to live with me in atlanta how did you guys meet remotely? So you, you brought up that reality TV show. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Love is Blind. And um, and she watched Love is Blind. And I'm the first face that pops up and talks to you. Uh-huh. Um, and then I kind of disappear from the show. So mm-hmm. I, the, the premise of the show is, can people fall in love without ever seeing each other? Mm-hmm. So you're, you're interacting through a wall. Um, and and the, the point of the show is to propose sight unseen. So get down on a knee on the other side of a wall and say, uh, you know, will you spend the rest of your life with me? And I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I wasn't a big part of the show, but I was part of the early stages and she and I knew each other, knew of each other in college. So she, from eight years ago, sees this face pop up and be like, I think I recognize that guy. And, uh, and finds me on social media and, um, we go back and forth briefly on, on like, like text or whatever, mm-hmm. but almost immediately go into phone calls. And, uh, and for 10 days we had no visual, uh, phone calls. We kind of did our own little love is blind experiment. Mm-hmm. So 10 days only talking. And we, we started talking like seven, eight, nine hours a day. Um, like in one continuous conversation. So I was, She's on the West Coast. So I was basically staying up all night. She was staying up late. And uh, and we we just felt like that maybe maybe a similar feeling of what you felt when you're working with Dr. Hart. I'm just like, this is meant to be. Mm-hmm. There's some kind of serendipity I can't explain here. Mm-hmm. There, you know, I'm gonna sound crazy if I try. So I'm just gonna trust it and go with it. And you know, the first time I saw her in person was when I picked her up at the airport the day that she was moving in. Um, <laughs> and so we, we've been together uh, coming up on four months now and she just got rid of her lease in San Francisco, put all of her stuff in a storage unit and I picked her up at the airport last night. So we're, we're officially cohabitating now, but I, you know, when you, when you're talking about all this uh, with bio cyber, not mm-hmm. uh, it's something I'd love to try with her. Uh, uh- yeah, we have a meditation practice every morning. While coffee brews, we we sit together, mm-hmm. um, and, and that's been such a powerful experience for for us, and and a way to diffuse fights we're in the middle of, or a way to uh, come closer together. There's something about um, working on ourselves together mm-hmm. that, that is such a um, such a rewarding and an important practice. And, uh, and this sounds like more of the same, just like a really intense, amplified, extreme version of it. <laughs> totally. I think that's something like more couples could use. It's 
it's weird because like communicating is like so difficult. It, for some reason, it doesn't come natural to I think a lot of couples. Like they might be scared of um, being vulnerable or scared of hurting someone else's feelings or like repercussions of something that they might say. So there's like not like a true open line of communication. Um, and I think if you have two people that have like this like growth mindset and they have like the same foundation of like beliefs, then I think then you you're almost like guaranteed to have like a healthy half happy healthy relationship. But it's like too often people don't want to expose themselves in that way. Like some people, I can probably name half my friends. I'd be like, oh, like I'd be way too like embarrassed to meditate with my with my partner, husband, whatever. And to me, like that's crazy. That should be like the person you should be able to do anything in front of and not feel shame or embarrassment. Um, have you always been just like an open book when it comes to relationships? Like, how do you get to the point where you're like, hey, like, let's meditate while coffee brews? So I definitely not always like, I don't think, I don't know if anyone comes out of the womb like that. If, if someone has, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that'd be an interesting person, but no, it, no, it takes reps like anything else. It's, it's training, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's time input and reps. There's no way around it. If you want to get better at something, there's no substitute. There are no shortcuts. Mm-hmm. Like you, you put time in. Cause like even, even what you brought up, I, this, this is not intended as a call out by any means, but, but you brought up like, Hey, for two months after bio Cy- cyber, not, I was like spot on. Like I was, I was in it. And, and like, you can have a really intense experience and have this, the, the same alpha levels as a monk while you're there in person. But in order to retain that and make it a part of who you are, you need to, you need to weave it into your everyday life. You're always going to have access to the sensory deprivation cyber node little you know facility mm-hmm. right you got to build that in your, your yourself mm-hmm. otherwise it's just going to eventually go away um so it, yeah i i think um i mean back to your question i i think no <laughs> and, and that it's taken you know, time and repetition and and taking these little leaps of faith of like this person might think i'm super weird but like like hey have you tried breath work do you want to hyperventilate with each other <laughs> or whatever, you know? Um, and, and in general, like if, I, I think this is one of the, the secrets of life that people don't really talk about much, but if you're the first person to be vulnerable and be open and to kind of make a fool of yourself, it's such a gift to everyone else because you open up the space and the permission for them to be like, oh, I can act a fool too. Mm-hmm. Or I can, I can be open about my childhood trauma too, or I can, uh, talk about my past relationships and having sex with other people and whatever too. Mm-hmm. So like, if you if you just kind of like own it, it's like, hey, this is who I am. Like, I'm a human, just like everyone else. I make mistakes, uh, and here are some of my mistakes. Then it's it kind of like gives this safety uh, and and space and and permission to do the same. Mm-hmm. No, I totally agree. Um. I wanted to talk about – so I was reading um, some of your blogs about while you were filming and you had like a couple of lines that I thought were like really interesting. Um, well, first like your rules. I think it was really cool that you went in with like rules that you wanted to like try to maintain even though I think you said you broke all three, right? Which were like the no alcohol, don't talk about your dates with other people um, and no group thinking which I thought was – really cool because I think you see a lot of that right now, or at least it's amplified just because our thoughts are now visual because of like Twitter and Instagram. So like we're, we get to see what everyone's thinking or at least like a percentage of the population. So for me, like how do you, A, I guess, why did you make the rules? And then how do you avoid like group thinking? Mm, Okay. So one, thanks for reading my blog. You're one of like maybe four people. (laughs) You and my mom. It's really good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the alcohol thing was just like mitigate risk, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I know myself on alcohol. I like to have fun around my friends drinking. Mm-hmm. But like, do I want potentially millions and what turned into tens or hundreds of millions of people mm-hmm. watching Netflix with me being an idiot? <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> like, my decision making is going to suffer. That's the point of alcohol is like to lose your inhibitions. Sometimes mm-hmm. inhibitions are a good thing, especially when you're, you know, representing yourself, your family, your company, and everything else 
right. uh, in a big way. So I, I didn't break that rule. Um, there, there are a few shots where I am holding a beer and we cheers and we drink, but that was facilitated by producers. Mm -hmm. But but they had an unlimited amount of alcohol on set. Like if something got down to a, a fourth of whiskey left, there's another one right behind it. Like like people were, I, I think, drunk the whole time that I was there. <laughs> Some people. So like really glad I stuck to that. Um, I, I will say, and this is a personal preference, everyone's different, but if, if you're trying to do self-work and if you're trying to build a relationship with someone else, I, I think um, either limiting or eliminating substances from that experience is a really good foundation to build. Mm -hmm. And you start to introduce them when you become more comfortable and confident with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think relationships with yourself kind of work the same way mm -hmm. as, as relationships with someone else. So like, if you're trying to do self work, personal development work, and, um, and, and substances are currently a part of that, just, just experiment with trying a week. It, it might be hard at the beginning, but like try, try eliminating that and see what kind of progress you make, uh, mm -hmm. even if it is a little bit more painful. And then you can always reintroduce that kind of stuff back in later. Like, hey, let's smoke together, see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but there's already a foundation to fall back on there. So, uh, that's the substance thing. The second rule was don't talk about my dates. Like I knew I was walking into a, a inherently dramatic situation and there's going to be a lot of drama instigated outside of my control. So what I could control was what I said. So what I decided to talk about was myself, my nonprofit, chess boxing. I, I didn't stir up any drama because I knew we were all competing over the same uh, group of, of, of women. So, um, you know, I just didn't want to pour any fuel on that fire. And I, I ended up on the show, uh, falling for the same woman that another guy did. And so we were in a love triangle. He and I actually ended up teaming up. So I, I inherently had to, to talk about, uh, that with him, but mm -hmm. I, I still kept away from doing it with, with everyone else. So uh, the last, the last one, and I think this one's, yeah, especially important now. And um, I don't just mean now like COVID and, and, uh, and protests and all that kind of stuff, but now just in an era of social media, mm -hmm. when, it, when it's so easy to um, be influenced and, and you know, uh, consume content that could be great or could be detrimental. Um, it's really important to, to invest in your own moral compass and, and get to know yourself. Cause without, without that kind of directional awareness and, and knowing who you are, you're going to go from, from shepherd to shepherd. You know, you're, you're going to, you're, you're kind of going to be a sheep. That's, that's just kind of led through life. Mm -hmm. um, maybe by the same shepherd your whole life, or maybe from, from different ones. Cause you, you aren't really going to know like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a sheep, but I can, you know, I could evolve. I could, I could be more than this. Um, so I think, I think investing in uh, the, the bio cybernaut kind of thing or, or going and spending some time in a monastery or going and, and just getting a freaking therapist, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, writing the check, showing up, uh, owning it and, and, and starting to do that work on stuff that you, you don't even know that you've bottled up. You don't even know where the blockages are, but I, I think that's the first step to, to leaving group think behind because mm -hmm. once you know who you are you know what fits with you and you know it doesn't and mm -hmm. you might still be group thinking but it'll be with uh, with a group that's much more in line with who you are and who you want to be mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be easier to recognize hey these these thought patterns these people these um you know this group doesn't resonate with uh, my best self and and who i'm striving to be right it's like more of a conscious decision yeah yeah, exactly. You, you can be a little bit more in control of what you consume and how you act. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I spent those five days and the five silent days in the monastery and about a week there in total, right before I walked on the set for Love is Blind. Oh, wow. So like it was night and day. Like I, I literally had 72 hours between when I flew back from Thailand to when I walked on set at Pinewood. <laughs> So you probably it was probably amplified too then right like a lot of people's behaviors because you're you're going from like this very like zen introspective 
you know, scenario to everyone's like me, me, me and alcohol and oh man. It was crazy. It, it, it like the justice position could not have been more intense. <laughs> and and I, I feel so lucky. Like that wasn't really the plan. Mm -hmm. um, it just kind of happened that way. But I, I never had a better sense of who I was, what my trauma was, how to open up to people. Cause I just opened up to myself. Like it, it primed me in all the right ways. And mm -hmm. I was able to share that with other people who were like falling apart. And I was like sober, pretty well rested, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, could, could share like, Hey, maybe think about it this way, or you don't have to beat yourself up too much. Like be nice to yourself. Like, <laughs> like little, little things that, that turned me into a kind of a, um, you know, a helpful force on, on cast. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer to be that than hurtful. <laughs> my, um, so my favorite, I think my favorite thing that you wrote about in your blog was the apple crisp situation. I was like, if more people had this perspective, like how much healthier would relationships be? So, um, I guess do you want to like catch people up like really quick on what that, what that app, the apple crisp situation was, uh, you know, it's, it's not dissimilar from the fight you had with your mom, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it's, um, yeah. So the, I guess the basic thing that was at play with the apple crisp was making something about me that mm -hmm. didn't need to be about me. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and instead of seeing something as, um, as what it was, which was a really positive, uh, generous act, mm -hmm. I thought as a, as a personal attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the, the context was, uh, the first day that we could send gifts back and forth across the facility to the people that we were dating, Danielle, the, the person that, uh, both Rory and I fell for sent two gifts. One was a private gift just between me and her in, in our little dating pod. She sent me a yoga mat and let a yoga flow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm a certified yoga instructor. We connected on yoga because she is too. Uh, so it was like an awesome gift. When I came back from that date, there was an apple crisp sitting on uh, the kitchen counter. And it was for Rory. And Rory is, uh, he has dietary restrictions. He wasn't able to eat a lot of the food that we ate. And, and so Danielle, being the sweetheart that she is, cooked a vegan apple crisp for worry that, that he could eat and that would be tasty and good and all that kind of stuff. And I immediately saw that as a threat. I was like, that gift means that she has feelings for someone else and I got possessive and jealous and uh, competitive and all those things. And it took, uh, you know, basically sitting like, like going to meditation and, and like seeing that situation from more angles to realize like, Oh, I'm, I'm being a, a self-centered asshole here. Like this was a, uh, this was an act of generosity because Rory can't eat. She has feelings for him too. They might be romantic. Like they are for me. They might be friendly in which case she can still, you know, she can cook either of those people an apple crisp and it has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. So um, earlier producers had tried to get us into a, a interview about the apple crisp. And I, I basically just kind of like shut it down. I was like, I'm not hungry right now. Uh, I just had, you know, an avocado. I don't know. I made something else. And then after I'd sat, I was like, okay, I'm ready. And, and we sat down for the interview. I went up and I, I grabbed the apple crisp and two forks and I put it in between us. And I explained that, that same kind of, of thought process. I was like, listen, man, like we both fell for an incredible girl. I can't blame you. You can't blame me. Um, you know, and, and she's ultimately going to make the decision that's best for her. So let's not try to compete with each other. Like whoever wins actually gets Danielle. Like Danielle's a person. Like it's not something to be won. Mm -hmm. You know, it's someone. Uh, so let's just be on team Danielle. Like we, we were each other's best friend on the show prior to finding out about Danielle. And that could have changed that, but it didn't. We just decided like, okay, we're going to show as much of ourselves to Danielle as possible so she can make as informed of a decision as possible. And then we'll support that decision and we'll still be friends with each other. There's other fish in the sea. I don't want to be, you know, in love or, or with someone that doesn't want to love, love or be with me. So like, let her make the decision and move forward. And, uh, and that, that diffused a lot of the potential drama that could have arise from that situation. And it's probably why, Danielle, Rory, and I weren't featured on the show. 
<laughs> Which is totally okay. It's to- too friendly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but I think that uh, the, wor- the world may not be as entertaining if, mm-hmm. if people acted that way, but I, I think people would be um, happier and, and more whole if um, – if people were able to to see situations that way. I do too. You were saying like that in that, like once you took that time to sit, that you were like free from jealousy and attachment. And I love that you specified attachment because for me, I I find that a lot of people when it comes to like romantic relationships, they have like this possessiveness over the person. Like, Like that's my person. I own that person. And that's why a lot of people are in – um, like monogamous relationships or a lot of people have jealousy issues, whatever it is. Like I know girls that aren't even allowed to go out without their significant significant other. Like can't even go out for like a girl's night, whatever, because like the jealousy is just so intense. So I guess um, – and I get asked this a lot from like a lot of my male viewers is like how would you start to tackle – like jealousy and attachment, like for someone that like recognizes that it's like an unhealthy habit that they're in, like how do you deal with like that visceral reaction and then try to like eventually work it out? Mm. I'm going through this. <laughs> I bet any any guys watching this, if you don't think you're going through this, you just aren't in a situation where you're caring enough about someone or, or uh, it, it hasn't bubbled up for you yet. But we all have it. It's normal. It's something to talk about. Like, it usually stems from some sort of insecurity, inadequacy, or abandonment from our past. Not being good enough, mm-hmm. right? If, if, if your partner is, is looking at someone else or wants to be with someone else, it, it's taken as a personal attack. I'm not good enough. I can't satisfy you in that way. You're mm-hmm. looking elsewhere. But really, it could have nothing to do with you. Right. You know, it, it could be a, an addition instead of because of a deficit, I'm trying to fill that hole. Um, so I, I think my answer to this, not that I'm qualified to necessarily give advice on this, <laughs> um, I'm definitely still like navigating this. It, I, I'm in the first exclusive committed relationship uh, now that I've, I've, I've been in, in five years. So um, so I'm definitely still navigating this. And, um, but, but I, I think, I think the answer is the same and, and probably will be the same for any kind of personal development questions like this, but start with yourself, like dig into, uh, you know, I have, I have abandonment issues from a kid. My parents separated when I was nine months old. My dad, uh, took himself out of the situation. I, I similarly, similarly had, um, you know, like, mother past past relationships all feel like someone was leaving me and that's how I perceived it. So, um, you know, digging into at least knowing why you're having these feelings will really help you like wrap your head around them and not be like, um, you know, this is, uh, this is all my fault. You know, this, this, this exists for, for a reason. Like it's, it's for you to, to overcome, um, and, and go through not, uh, ignore and and project onto others because really that that suffering that's inside you is coming out on others. Your your partner probably wants to go out and have a fun girls' night with her friends, mm-hmm. and, and you're keeping her from doing that because you aren't digging into your shit. Right. Like, like oh, open up that that you know that that bag and and, and shuffle around in there and see see what comes <laughs> out because because otherwise you're you're going to be limiting not just your partner but yourself. You know it's. Um, And you might push someone away that otherwise would be a great partner for you. So Mm -hmm. I don't think anything would be more important than, than doing the self work. It's not, it's not her problem Mm -hmm. uh, wanting to go out and have fun with her friends or, or, or even to talk to other guys. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's your problem. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Own it. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. That's just, that's really good advice. Just own it. What's your experience with that? that world. I'm sure you have a lot more reps. Yeah, we definitely have a lot of reps, a lot. Um, So it's really weird because I used to be the most jealous person on the face of the planet, like the most – like just wildly unhealthy level uh, level of jealousy. And I think a lot of that had to do with insecurity. A lot of it had to do with um, the modeling that I kind of saw growing up, like just my examples – 
And I just thought that was normal. So I had, you know, I have similar like abandonment issues. So there was, you know, a fear of loss. Um, And I think I placed like so much of my self-worth in how my partner like saw me. So if there was no partner, then like there was no worth kind of thing. So it was just like this whole like perfect storm of work that I had to like kind of confront and like programming that I had to undo because it's like, okay, well, this isn't actually what I think or like these aren't the principles that I want to I want to live by, right? Like I'm not happy. Like I would be like neurotic about going through phones or where is this person? And then eventually you have a person that might not be cheating that starts cheating, right? Because it's like, well, if you're going to suffer the consequences and they might as well do, do what they want. Um, and then – I finally met someone that kind of like challenged me on these things. I'm like, well, you're acting like irrational. Like this isn't healthy. I love you, but you're pushing me away. And then I was kind of like forced to kind of confront like my own like shortcomings and like bad behaviors. And it it took a while. And then it took me um, getting into the adult industry and then like having that conversation with him like, okay, well, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for like a relationship? Because so many people define a relationship by being monogamous. So if you're not monogamous, then you are not in a relationship or you're not serious or you're not committed. And then I think what we found along the way is like that doesn't necessarily have to be true. Like you can be in a committed relationship and then be in something that's not monogamous. You can be poly, you can be open, you could be swingers, whatever it is. I think commitment looks differently to um, to everybody. And I think it's important to, to just kind of like outline what are like the parameters of this relationship? Like what do I expect of you? What do you expect of me? And we can come to an agreement that works for both of us and then hopefully like just respect each other's boundaries. And I think um, the problem is, is a lot of people have like this cookie cutter idea of what those boundaries should be. And rather than saying, well, actually, I don't care about this or this doesn't really bother me or I look at love in this other way. So like making it more personal and like having those talks with your partner. Um, Again, because like, I mean – I know women that men can't go to a Hooters, right? Like I personally find that absurd. But like the concept of even looking at the opposite sex is like a is a no no. So for my my definition of love is is freedom. Like at like unconditional love is freedom. So I think it's every day making that decision to be committed to that person, to love that person, to take care of them, you know what I mean, like in for like the long haul. So I think that the way that we have our relationship, which is it's open, it's not like, you know, either of us are out every night with somebody else. Like we both haven't been with anyone else in like years um, just because it just hasn't happened because it's not like a, a forced thing. Um, but it's, I feel like there's a lot more security that comes from the way that we look at it because it's like if someone does have a physical relationship outside of like the two of us, it's not a deal breaker. It's not all of a sudden we're getting divorced and then all of a sudden our child has to be in two homes, right? Like it's it's love beyond that. It's love beyond the jealousy. It's love beyond like myself, right? I don't know. It just – it's so hard to like just – to put into a sentence but I just find – I find a lot more security when there's freedom, ironically. I I, I think you did a great job. That, that should be a clip. Like, <laughs> like, like start and end, you're talking about that. I think people need to hear that. You know, it's not gonna it's not gonna fit for everyone. It's not not everyone associates love with freedom. But um, a lot of a lot of conversations with my my girlfriend are around freedom. Yeah, you know, for the last five years, I went where I want it when I want it. I connect with who I want it, when I want it. It, it was a, it's a very free life. And so part of what I'm reconciling right now is, is how do I marry that freedom to, uh, to commitment? And, and what, it, what are those commitments that I'm comfortable with? And what are the ones that, that don't fit me? Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and so a lot of our conversations kind of surround that. And I, I love the way you put, um, you know, love beyond jealousy and attachment for for the sake of someone that's bigger than yourself like hey just because one of us gets swept up in the moment or or feel something for someone else doesn't mean that our kid has to live in two homes right you know that's that's a it's a really good dose of perspective of like what really matters here 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, it sounds like having, having the freedom liberates you from having to exercise it. Whereas having the confinement may make you want to rebel against that confinement and do it. Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that a fair assessment? Is that oversimplifying it? No, not at all. And I feel like, because it was like in the beginning, <laughs> it's so funny because my husband was like, is this a trick? Like, am I going to get in trouble? Like, does she really mean it? So he would be too nervous to even like consider acting on like our arrangement of like, you know, if you do want to, you know, go out and do your thing, like that's fine. I was traveling a lot for work at the time. Like when I say a lot, like I mean 25 to 27 days a month. Um, so it's kind of like a just like I want you to like still enjoy your life and have fun. And he was like, there's no way she actually means this. Like, she's going to go crazy. Like, it, this is a trick, whatever. Um, and once he got over that initial fear, I feel like it was almost like he played around with it. But just like knowing it was there was enough. Like, he didn't – like, it lost all of its, um, I guess, appeal because it no longer was like a taboo thing. So, I mean, no one would believe it. But like, it's been like probably less than a handful of occasions. And this has been over – I don't know, seven years. So wow. yeah, I know. So I think when you say when you say open, people automatically assume that we're both just being like totally promiscuous and it's, you know, this free for all and there's no way that there's actually like this love and commitment. It's it's just saying like, I understand you're human, you understand that I'm human. If we truly want to like mean what we say when we say like till death do us part, like we have to understand like we are both gonna fuck up several times, like probably like an infinite amount of times throughout this marriage, right? And it's not necessarily always going to be infidelity. It's going to be in a whole like, mess of ways, especially when you're raising a child. So we look at the whole open concept like across the board, right? It's like you're allowed to be human. You're allowed to make mistakes. And guess what? Like I'm still going to be here and we're going to work on this together. So if you sleep with somebody else, like I'm not going anywhere. And if it becomes a problem, we can talk about it. We can fix it and we can create new boundaries. If you mess up in some way as like the I see your parenting, right? Again, like I'm still going to be here and we can navigate that and like kind of problem solved together. So I think we just kind of take that lens and apply it throughout the entire marriage, like as our philosophy or like how we want to be as a couple and how we want to be as parents. And it's like understanding that there are flaws and there are going to be mistakes. And we have to try to avoid that knee jerk reaction of like, you did something wrong to me. So now I have to leave, right? Because again, it goes back to like saying me, me, me and having like this egocentric way of looking at relationships instead of saying like, okay, like we're we're one, right? Like we are one. Like this is a family unit. So like you have to kind of take the ego outside of it. And when you remove the ego, like you kind of find jealousy not really appearing as much. It just naturally happens. What what a beautiful way to look at a relationship and look at life. It's really inspiring. Uh, I hope more people hear that, adopt that and and apply it. Um, I, I also think it can be applied beyond uh, a marriage. Totally. Like we're, we're all one. Mm-hmm. We all, we all make mistakes. Something I do to someone else. I'm, I'm actually doing it myself too. You know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it's a really, really difficult thing to do, but going in with the permission to fail uh, exactly. is, is liberating and it, and it leads to much better results. Mm-hmm. You don't have the fear and stress and anxiety of, I fuck up, I lose everything. Right. Like one mistake could cost me my family. Like how awful is that way to live? Yeah. It's living in fear. Mm-hmm. Instead of living in an abundance. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the other important thing is just because you can doesn't mean you will. Exactly. You know, a, lot, a lot of people take that as like, oh, like I get a get out of jail free card or I, I get a hall pass, like mm-hmm. time to go tramping around or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that. No, you know, I, I think that I think people tend to take some people tend to take the worst version of what it could mean, mm-hmm. which is, oh, I'm in an open relationship, which means I'm just resigning to being cheated on for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Like, no, <laughs> like, let's pump the brakes there. It doesn't have to mean that. It no. just mean if we do mess up, it's it's OK. Still be here. Exactly. Exactly. It's. It's just like living in like, I don't know, it just, again, to me, it's just the more, it's the more freedom you have, 
just the more solid of a commitment there is, the more like secure that relationship is because again, like you both have made it clear we're both allowed to fail, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really important message. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> of course. So I'm here. Um, so I always like to end with asking if you believe in like fate or destiny. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> casual closer. Have you read um have you read The Alchemist? No. Oh, Candace. <laughs> Write it down, Paulo Coelho, you'll knock it out in two, three days. It's a children's okay. book. But it, it it's it is the most important book I've ever read and I reread it every year. So it's, um, it's about a shepherd boy named Santiago who has a recurring dream that leads him to sell a sheep and go out in pursuit of what, what the author calls a personal legend, but what, what really means fate or destiny. So um, all of us have a, a voice inside our head. All of us talk to ourselves. All of us have this, uh, this inner dialogue. And, and if you pay attention to that inner dialogue, you start to recognize some patterns. And at least one of those patterns that you'll recognize is some sort of calling. It, it's a call to action. If you aren't already on purpose, on path, then there, there is something conspiring to help you get onto that purpose and that path is, is the premise of the book. So, um, I, I adopt that and live that and feel that and, and breathe that every day. It's, it's something where um, once I was exposed to that idea, it, similar, to, similar to other things we've talked about in this conversation, it, it was impossible to unknow that, mm-hmm. right? Like what, once I heard it and it was real, then I, I, couldn't, I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't get away from it. It, it was something that... Um, I knew it was true. Mm-hmm. And, and once, once that belief kind of set in, once that seed was planted, I, I couldn't stop it from, from growing. So things like brawl for a cause, things like chess boxing, things like now fight and flow, like what, what I'm building now, all of those things are so fully me that I couldn't possibly create those things for myself. They, they weren't things that like, you know, I, I didn't go out doing a Google search for combining chess with boxing, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like it, it, it manifested in my life because I, I, I figured out who I am. I listened to that voice and I started asserting myself as that person. And, and the world kind of conspires around that kind of assertion in, in my experience. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and I think a lot of people who uh, get into that alchemist kind of, uh, of thought process or, or belief system experience the same type of, of life and, and purpose that, that there is something to all this, even though we don't understand it, acknowledging that it's there is important. And, and that whatever this is has some sort of rules of engagement. Karma is one of them. You know, mm-hmm. every, every belief system has an element of karma, even science. You know, you, you look at Christianity, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You look at the East and, and literal karma, yin and yang, action and reaction. And, and you look at Newton's third law, a reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. It's the same, it's saying the same things. So once you adopt that belief system and, and be like, okay, there is something to all this, then destiny and fate is, is, a, is a very uh, natural next step to that. Of, mm-hmm. If there is something to all this, then there's something to all this. You know, whatever my life is, is, is to tell a story or to learn a lesson or to uh, fall in love or, or whatever you decide to assign meaning to your life. And, and I think there's a degree of uncovering and self-work that comes before that. But I, I think it's an inevitability. If you decide, hey, I want my life to have meaning and purpose, um, then, then your, your, your destiny follows. Oh, that's beautiful. You put that perfectly. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no. I kind of figured that was you were going to go that direction, just like someone who like makes the decisions that you do and like you explaining like your chess boxing and, you know, meeting this girl in quarantine. You guys are already living together. It just seems like you kind of recognize like these almost like little notifications. You're like, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take that. That's the right way to go. 
Ah, that, that's a good way to put it. Like, yeah, if you don't look at your phone, you won't see any notifications coming in. So, mm-hmm. it, it's, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not advising to look at your phone more. <laughs> imagine, <laughs> imagine your soul as as the screen of a phone. Right. And like, be open to receiving those notifications and then deciding what to do with them. Some of them are for you, some of them aren't, and it's and it's your. Uh, I think that's where free will comes in. Mm-hmm. If you're going to have cycles of temptation and trials that, that are up to you to overcome in pursuit of your personal legend, of your destiny. Right. Like almost like a test. Like, okay, you say you want this one thing. So I'm going to present you the thing that you said that you want. And then I'm going to present you this other thing. And which one are you going to take? You know what I mean? And that other thing is going to look super tasty. Yeah. And thing And and it's gonna it's probably gonna recycle something from your past where you made that decision in the past and you lean into it and there's a pleasure associated, but there's ultimately pain because it led you away from your your destiny. Like mm-hmm. you're gonna see those things. Life is kind of like a video game. Mm-hmm. You're gonna see those things level after level after level. They're gonna keep coming into your life, keep testing you, keep and you're gonna have to overcome those trials again and again. Mm-hmm. But like anything else, time and repetitions. You're going to get better and better and better at taking those things on, navigating them positively, and staying on path. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the same if you sit for meditation and your mind keeps wandering. You're going to get better at staying focused or, mm-hmm. or removing layers and, and, and drilling down past the ego to, to your core. And, and in life, it's, it's no different. Mm-hmm. Well, this was incredible, especially because it's the first time we actually have like spoken in anything other than text. Um, thank you so much for joining me. 100%. Yeah, I, I want to be friends. Yeah, me too. Yeah, as soon as like we're allowed to like travel and like actually interact, I would. Oh, I wanted to ask too. Um, how did you meet Brandon? Uh, so Brandon and I are both part of the same community. I, I've been in it for four years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he just joined a month or two ago. Um, it's called Lifestyle Engineers. It's a it's a group of uh, digital nomads and entrepreneurs that mm-hmm. uh, design their lifestyle the way they want to live life and and share uh, experience and and systems. So I, I'm kind of a black sheep in the community because mm-hmm. most of the people in uh, in the community are very data driven, have um, more analytical backgrounds where they're tracking every little thing that they do and are able to share. Uh, like data regressions of their morning routine over, you know, the course of 18 months or whatever. And, and I'm, I live my life almost completely intuitively. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll do the same kind of AB testing, but I won't do it with data. I'll do it with, with emotions and, and, uh, and feelings. Um, so a- anyway, uh, Brandon recently applied uh, and got admitted. And one of the other, one of the founders of the group, uh, did a, like a warm introduction between the two of us. Cause he's working on building a new company that has a very similar mission to brawl for a cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was like, Hey, just talk. And, uh, and we hopped on a few phone calls, uh, kind of when Brandon was in a, a pretty serious transition in his, uh, in his relationship and in business. Um, and they were both transitions that I had some experience with. And so I gave him some unsolicited advice. <laughs> um, and he was like, Hey, I want to come down and visit you. So last weekend, yeah, last weekend he, he drove down to Atlanta and spent the weekend with me. Um, we got to know each other better and, and are collaborating on something, um, uh, professionally and, and are definitely, you know, personal friends moving forward. So, uh, oh, awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a great little group of, of people. Uh, we, we have people living in five continents. Um, there's only like 26 or 27 of us. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, any, anywhere you go uh, abroad, uh, there's either someone to like stay with or someone that's been there that can give you recommendations or someone to come meet you there. So like, um, you know, I, one of the people that owns hotels in Romania and, uh, and England uh, so I've stayed with him a couple times and um, stay, I, I've gone to India with a few of them and all that kind of stuff. So um, anyway, cool, cool group of people. And there's nothing more important in life than relationships. Like if you're, if you're trading resources for uh, relationships um, in a positive way, you're doing it right. And if you're, if you're doing the trade off where you're hurting relationships by trying to gather resources, uh, I challenge that. Um, mm-hmm. There's nothing more important than love and, and uh and spending your life with other people it's beautiful and i couldn't agree more
<laughs> Couldn't agree more. But yeah, it was um, it was great meeting you. I will uh, definitely stay in touch. Hopefully, when this is all over, we can actually meet in person. Yeah, for sure. You're you're up by Brandon, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. Wilmington. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I'll be up in your neck of the woods. If you ever come to Atlanta, let me know. Will do. Well, have a good day. Right back at you. Thanks, Candice. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> See ya. Thank you so much for listening to Chatting with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Horvath. If you have a minute, please rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening. And you can always visit us on Patreon if you want to support the podcast that way. You get exclusive um, tidbits, you get early episodes, and a lot of bonus features on there. You go to chattingwithcandace.com for more information. We'll see you next week.